We're in a sermon series called One Day, and our conviction here is that one day can change everything. Like literally one day can change your life. And so two weeks ago, we talked about that one day where uh, Jesus, before he could change the world, he had to struggle with his internal world and wrestle with God, the Father, in prayer, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, where he literally wrestled and said, not my will, but thine be done. And just the day of surrender. The greatest day in your life will be the day that you surrender. And last week we talked about the day of salvation. And we talked about this. The first convert in heaven was a convict. Come on, somebody. They're like, all right, you're just letting anybody in, huh? Yep. <laughs> They're with me. They're, they're welcome in. And so just a beautiful salvation. And today we're going to be talking about the fall of man. And uh, we'll get into that in just a moment. But I want to turn your attention to Revelation chapter 12. Uh, before we go back to Genesis chapter 3. I want to read this, and I know whenever uh, we go to Re- the book of Revelation, people get scared and like they buckle up and put their helmet on. Okay, we're ready. Um, it's not that scary, but it is, it is kind of heavy here. Uh, Revelation 12 and 9 says this, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. So he's a deceiver and he's an accuser. Those are his, that's kind of like his, uh, his job description. He accuses the brethren. Um, and, and he's also a deceiver. So he deceives and he accuses, uh, speaks to the saints and deceives and he speaks to God and he accuses. Uh, he's got a couple of names here. He's dragon, he's the serpent, he's the devil, he's Satan. Uh, but what's in a name, right? How many's ever, how many's ever gone to Facebook and looked up your name and all the people that have your name? You ever done that before? I'm like, I just want to see if the other Chadwick Kings out there are representing well. <laughs> all right, you're doing well, sir. You need some help, Chadwick from Virginia. I'm going to call you, give you a little boost. But anyways, um, what's in a name? Different ways that we, we call, see Satan. Lucifer, who has been the fallen one, that angel that was in the presence of God. In him was the timbrel. In him were like these lights and um, these, these gems. And whenever he stood in the presence of God, just the, there was a light show in heaven. And so now he's in rebellion to God. He leads the whole world astray, leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power. Let me just stop right there. It's not just being saved, it's the power of salvation that has entered into your life. It's not just the penalty of sin that's gone, but it's the power of sin that has lost its grip. Can I get an amen from anybody? So the, 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 the salvation and power of the kingdom of God and the authority authority of his, everybody say it with me, Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb. We just sing about that. And the word of their testimony. Amen. So we're going to be talking about in just a moment, uh, Proto-Evangelion, it is the first gospel or it's the first good news given to the world, and we'll get into that in Genesis chapter three. But before we do that, I'd love for you to bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we open our hearts to you. Let your living word teach the written word. Let it fall into good ground, bring forth much fruit. Uh, bless this moment, our minds, and let the Holy Spirit teach us in Jesus' name, and everybody say <clears throat> amen. I love this time of year. It's um, not just allergy season, but very soon, very soon, uh, it's going to be summer. Um, how many like summer? Anybody like summer? Uh, summer vacation's coming. We're going to be excited. The kids not in school anymore for about two weeks, and then we're going to be wanting them to go back to school. But <laughs> it's summertime. I remember growing up, my two favorite days of school were the last day of school, right? The last day of school was like the best, signing yearbooks, hanging out, you know, doing like the, being cool, it's summertime, you know, we wore tank tops and flex and had a sticker that looked like a tattoo, it wasn't really, it was just like, it was like cool to be cool. And, uh, and then my second favorite was the first day of school. The first day of school was, how many remember like the first day of school? Like the Jan Sport backpack, showing up to school with your new shoes. My birthday was August, is, is August 24th. And back in the day, school started for us after Labor Day. And so I got a new pair of shoes every birthday. And so I always like show them new shoes and a new shirt, new backpack, right? And it was just like cool to be in the next grade. Like you're just a little bit cooler. 
But what they did was, and I don't know if they still do this, um, but they give you a list of things that you'll need for school, right? So you need, you need your pencils and you need your trapper keeper. Remember a trapper keeper? How many had a trapper keeper? I had a Ninja Turtle trapper keeper. I was super cool. And so you had to have certain pencils and pens, and then it was like, oh, not just a blue pen, you need a, a red pen. We're gonna be underlining stuff and, and, and doing grammar. It's gonna, you're gonna be so smart. And so it was like, okay, this the new year. The list is revealing what we're gonna need, what we're gonna be doing. It's gonna be, it's gonna be so awesome. But I remember so vividly my first list as in TK in kindergarten and first grade. It involved crayons. Like, I don't know the last time I used a crayon. I don't know the last time. But it was like, I remember getting the small little eight pack of crayons. It, re it required on my list for TK was eight crayons, right? The little eight pack. And then in kindergarten, they're like, no, we need the 16 pack. I was like, we're going 16? We're doing 16 crayons? This is amazing. And then in like first grade, they're like, no, you need the 64 pack. We're gonna be really drawing things and coloring things. We're gonna, we're gonna take coloring to the next level in first grade. And I was like, I am becoming just, I'm, 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 I'm maturing quicker than I can even imagine. <laughs> but I was, I was reading an article this week about colors. And again, we know this, but when you think about it, it's kind of mind blowing that like with all the animation of colors, the, 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 the millions of different versions and, and, and nuanced colors, um, at the end of the day, they're just three colors. At the end of the day, there's primary colors, right? Who remembers the primary colors? Red, yellow, and blue, right? And out of that are all the other, you guys did not do well in first grade. <laughs> Okay, out of that are all the colors. Like in all the colors are those basic colors. It's really that simple, that basic. And so today is like, we're going back to the primary gospel. We're gonna, we're gonna look at the Bible in its most fundamental, simplistic way. All the colors, all, all the principles of the Bible come back to this story we're about to read in Genesis chapter three, where we learn about the nature of God the nature of man, and the nature of our enemy, the adversary, the devil. Now, with all that said, let me remind you that God works through spiritual laws, okay? Spiritual laws. These spiritual laws are understandable, they're real, and they are consistent. Everybody say consistent. These laws you cannot break, you cannot bend, they are real. You may, not be, you may not be aware that they exist right now, but you may be walking in these laws, you may be breaking or violating these laws, but they're real, just like gravity, right? Gravity is a fundamental uh, law in our universe. It is something that we experience every day. We don't think about it. We don't wake up and go, hello, gravity. How are we gonna interact today? Even though we feel the effects of gravity, on certain parts of our body. I'm like, that's not me eating a donut. That is gravity, babe. Anyways, long story short, there are things that are happening around us in the natural world. Gravity, energy, chemistry. You go out in the sun and you stay out in the sun too long for that beautiful tan, you'll get burnt. There's just things that are like, that are, that are absolute, right? We can work around those. We can, we can build around those, but we're working in and around these laws, whether we know it or not. Same thing with spiritual laws. There's a, there's a story of a guy named Steve Callahan who uh, was, uh, he, he did a lot of work commercially in the ocean. And so when he was on his boat in the Atlantic Ocean and the, the, literally the boat began to sink and he was out on a small little raft for two and a half months, everyone said he should be dead. There's no way that Steve Callahan should make it. <clears throat> but he did because he understood the rules, okay? He understood the currents that were in the Atlantic Ocean. He understood, he had, he, when, when, he was, when the boat was going down, when his boat was going down, he, he didn't grab water. He, he did, there's a lot of things he could have grabbed. He grabbed three pencils so he could make a sextant, so he could know how to navigate to get into the right currents. And after two and a half months, the dude survived because he knew the rules and how this worked, how the ocean worked, right? And so this is what I want for you and this is what I want for us to understand 
God's nature, our nature, and the devil's nature, okay? We're, we're understanding the, these things because these give, us, these give us like coordinates of how to walk and how to live and how to correspond with the laws of God, the works of God, the will of God. And because God wants you to prosper, it's God's will for you to flourish in the land of the living. It's God's will for you not just to get saved and go to heaven. If that was the case, then we would just put you in the water, just hold you down, and just let you go straight to heaven. God wants you to navigate this life. By the way, congratulations. I promise we weren't gonna do that ever. But, but God wants you to navigate this life in like a very real, pr powerful, practical way for flourishing. That's what the scripture's here for. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to Genesis chapter three and we're gonna look at this story, this great story of this great fall, the fall of man. So it starts with the tree, right? Um, there's the tree of life and there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now it's interesting that good and evil come from the same tree because good is relative to evil, evil is relative to good. And so people say, I'm a good person based on what? Based on evil. I'm not an evil person, so I'm, based, I'm good. So there's the knowledge of God, there's the knowledge of good, there's the knowledge of evil. We want the knowledge of God, not just the knowledge of good and evil. It's better than, we're doing better than bad. Okay, that's not good enough. We want to do God's way, not just a good way, not just an evil way, right? Does that make sense? So there's, there's the two trees. And what this first tells us is this, is that everything in life ultimately is, is binary in some way. So a computer uh, system is, at the end of the day, if you boil it down, um, get to the primary components, it's zeros and ones. It's on, off, on, off, zeros and ones. That's a computer. So all of the things that you see on your computer, your tablet, your phone, it's just zero, one, zero, one, zero, one in, in, in some crazy programmed order, right? And so life is, in so many ways, binary. For instance, when God gave us two trees, and a lot of people are like, Man, why would God do this? Why would God give us the tree of life and then the forbidden? Well, number one, you can't have a relationship and you can't have covenant without decision. You can't have free will without a decision. And so this was a covenantial statement that, hey, we are gonna trust God, we're gonna walk in his word, and we're gonna have a relation with God. It's that simple. You get all the trees of the garden and the tree of life, and all you have to do is say no to the one that's in the midst of the garden, okay? Well, what does that mean? It means this, that life is all about yeses and nos. Yeses and nos. So what are you saying yes to? What are you saying no to? We have to say no to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so we can say yes to the tree of life. If we say yes to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then we have to say no to the tree of life. You can't have it all. Everything has boundaries. Birds have boundaries. Fish have boundaries. Airplanes, elevators have capacities and boundaries. Everything in life. And yet we so ostentatiously believe that we can have it all. Okay? They even invented a city where there's no boundaries. It's called Las Vegas. <laughs> Do it all, have it all. Everything that happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, except syphilis and chlamydia. But anyways, that's beside the point. That got real, real fast. So you can't, you can't, you can't say yes to I want an awesome marriage and also say yes to acting like a bachelor. You have to say no to one thing so you can say yes to another thing. We say no to a lot of things so we can say yes to a better preferred thing. Does that make sense? So life is about your yeses and noes. Let me, show me your yeses and noes and I will show you where you'll end up. At the end of the day, it's about yes. And that's why we try to steward people's yeses and noes. That's why next steps are important to us. That's why pe people who, who say, I'm gonna go to a small group, that's a big deal. Because we know you're not just going to a small group, you're saying no to something so you could say some, yes to something else. We know it's a commitment to be on a serve team, and on our dream team. We know it's a commitment because you're saying no to something so you can say yes to something else and vice versa. Life is about yeses and noes. So we, have, we live in a, in a world of what is called pluralism. And it's this idea, this hyper-individualism where it's like, I can have it all, I can be it all, I can do it all. And it is a misnomer that misrepresents God and it misrepresents your own soul. And at the end of that road is despair and pain. So let's look at the story. Genesis chapter three and one, it says this, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God 
had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? Let's just pause real quick and acknowledge we have a talking snake. <laughs> like, just think about that for a moment. What would you do if a talking snake began to have a dialogue with you? you maybe you would run. Maybe you would freak out. Maybe you'd be like, this is super awesome. You know, I, I don't know your personality. <clears throat> I hope you would do the right thing. But we have a talking snake. And, and I, I think it's in, imperative for us to see that when Satan manifests himself to Eve, to humanity, he doesn't do it as a lion, tiger, bear, oh my. He doesn't do it as a witch, a warlock, or some you know, being that's got horns and a pitchfork. You're gonna do this. It's not about intimidation. It's about drawing you into an idea that is false about God and about yourself. It's a conversation. And this is how the enemy deceives. He, he deceives through ideas, false ideas that create false realities. So did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? Is this, is this like true? There's a question mark. This is the first question mark in the entire Bible. First one, Genesis 1, no question mark. Genesis 2, no question mark. Genesis 3, Satan comes in. Did God really say? Now, mind you, Eve was not there in Genesis 2. She, she wasn't even created yet whenever God told Adam, don't eat of the tree. So this is secondhand knowledge. So she's like, well, I, I think, which tells us a couple things. Number one, I wasn't there when God gave the Bible, the Ten Commandments to Moses. Let's say that, I wasn't there with the Ten Commandments. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't affect me. This is why the passing of the word of God is so vital to the prosperity of God's people in the world because we gotta know what God has said. Could you imagine if Adam was like, yo, babe, one of these trees is gonna kill you, but I'm not gonna tell you. But I'm gonna enjoy watching you eat. Warmer, warmer. You know, I don't know. I don't know that, what kind of weird game that would be. This is the one. This is, when God created me, he said, this is the tree right here, Okay. Very important information. Now, did God really say? Getting her to question the validity of God's word, the authenticity of God's word. Then, verse two, <clears throat> the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, you must not touch it, or you will <clears throat> die. So, let me tell you this, information is not enough. She had the right information. It wasn't enough. And one of the things that is imperative to us here at the Promise Center is not just to regurgitate information and download and dump information upon you. We want that information. We want the truth of God to come alive. And the truth of God will never come alive as long as you are just a student listening. Give me more information. You must become a disciple. And discipleship is movement. It's activation. There's some things you'll never understand till you're in certain situations, till you're walking out your faith, to that, that area of your life is being stretched and, 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 and pressed, and that is when you go, wow, that's, that's what that verse means. Yeah. And so we have people who know about verses. We can quote verses. We know them like fortune cookie, little pithy statements, but we don't, we don't know them. We don't have a relationship with the word of God, and we have to have a relationship with God's word or we don't win. Okay. okay. Verse four, <clears throat> you will not certainly die. So we have the first question mark in the Bible, kind of gets the seedbed ready for the, for the lie. You will not certainly die. You can do what you want. You can act, you can have all that you want and there'll be no consequences. You will not. He changes God's word with one word. He changes the meaning of God's commandment. One commandment, man. It's one. Like she knew the entire Bible because it was one <laughs> sentence. And all he did was change one word and it changed everything. Now, let me say this. The root of every sin is a lie that we believe. <clears throat> the root of every sin is a lie that we believe. <clears throat> whether it's an addiction, whether it's some behavioral proclivity that you've adopted into your personality 
through sin and that disorder of iniquity, that bitterness towards sin, whatever it is, we try to deal often with sin at a behavioral level, which I get. There's a, there's a component of that. We need to be renewed in our minds. All of that's important. But it really begins in our belief. Something we believed about ourselves, about God, about his word that is broken, that causes us to act in certain ways. When I used to meet with people who were going through, through a, a, a sin, I call it a sin pain, okay? Not just a life pain. In this life, you will have trouble. I'm talking about a sin pain, a self-inflicted thing. I always like, where, where, where are you believing wrong? What are you believing about God? Where are you seeing God the wrong way? Where are you seeing his word the wrong way? Let's go down to the root of belief because at the, the root of every sin is a lie that we believe. And sin is so deceptive and so deceiving in its sickness that it disguises itself as the cure. And so people get in this perpetual cycle of their own sinful sickness. So verse five says this, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. There is so much in this verse that is disturbing about what Satan is doing. Number one, what he's doing is this. He is accusing God of holding back goodness from Adam and Eve. There's, there's more for you. But God's holding it back. If you would do it your way, the Frank Sinatra way, the Las Vegas, I did it my way, then you'll be happy. Then you'll be complete. Then you'll reach that paragon of life and everyone will like you. You'll be on Facebook. You sneeze and you get a million likes because that's how awesome you'll be. Your boss will be like, raise, take a year off, paying you double because everything will work out if you do it your way, right? Now, that's not the only problem with this verse. The other problem is this, is that what he's tempting her with is you will be like, what does it say? You'll be like the devil. Is that what it says? The temptation of man is not to be a devil. The devil doesn't come to people and go, I'm gonna make you evil. I'm gonna make you wicked. Nobody ever starts out that way. Wicked, evil. No, what do we start out like? I wanna be God. I want to decide for me. I want to do it my way. You'll be like God. You'll, you'll have free range. You can live the way you want, act the way you want, talk the way you want. Do it your way, baby. That's how we do it at my house. It's my way, my life, my truth. My th and all of a sudden, what we're really saying is, I want autonomy from God. I want pure agency. No one's going to put baby in a corner. No one's gonna tell me what to do. I'm living my best life now. So, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What he's really at the end of the day saying is this, is when you eat it, you'll know what God knows. And God knows that if you know what God knows, you won't need God. You can decide right and wrong. Moral relativity, humanism, you are God. That's the spirit of our age. You're a God. You got it, baby. You're God. And that's the temptation. Not to be a devil, but to be God. Can I get an amen from anybody in the house? Okay. Now, what's at stake here? What's at stake is truth. John chapter 8 and 32 says this. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. Set you free. It's the truth that makes people free. It's the truth of God that makes people free. Not goosebumps. Not warm, fuzzy feelings. Not doing it your way. Truth is what makes people free. And that's what's being violated right here by Satan. Satan is good at confusing minds. Romans chapter one, they were confused in their minds. This is his modus operandi, is to confuse a generation, to confuse a world, to confuse hearts, to confuse people even in relationships, confusion, confusion, no truth. What is the truth? No absolutes, there's no absolutes, just no, no truth, no absolutes. And so here we go, we're living in a world 
where the sex, there is no sex, there are no stars. That's not real. Nothing's real anymore. It's just, it's all, there's no, there's no, there's no laws. There's no gravity. It's just, it's just, we're in a video game. We're in a video game right now. This is not all real. There's actually people that believe that we're actually in a video game right now. This is like the, the new cool thing to believe is like, we're, we're, we're at just all avatars. And so if I could, where, where's the mushroom that makes me big and strong? Where's the thing? I need it. I don't like my avatar very much. Okay, sorry. John chapter eight and 37. This is an important passage. Let's really think about this. It's kind of meaty, so here we go. John 8 and 37. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. This is what's at stake. I'm telling you what I have seen in my father's presence and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Okay, so now it's the difference in fathers. Abraham is our father, they answer. This is the Pharisees that want to kill Jesus. If you were Abraham's children, Jesus said, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me for I have come here from God. I have not come of my own will. God sent me. Why is my language not clear? Why can't you hear this? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. You're speaking a different language. You're speaking, we're, I'm speaking in a language of truth. You speak in a language of deception. And you carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the what? Truth. truth. What happened to Lucifer? He rejected the truth of God's glory and said, not that he'll be a devil. I will be like God. The same thing he tempts you with is what he was tempted with. And the same thing that happened to him, the fall, happened to us. Not holding the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. It's his first language. You ever heard people say that before? Right, it's their first language. How many, how many know more, more than one language in the room? And tongues doesn't count. How many, <laughs> how many know more than one language? Awesome, how many know three languages? Okay, awesome, come on, four? Wow, five? All right, you only know four. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he only knows four. <laughs> when I went to France, they, they had this joke. They said, what do you call someone who's, who knows uh, one lang uh, one, uh, three langu or two languages? And they, they said, bilingual. They said, what do you call someone who knows three languages? They said, they said uh, trilingual. They said, what, what do you call someone who knows one language? I said, what? They said, American. <laughs> so anyways, that was a good joke. I thought that was good. So... When the woman saw, verse six, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food, so now Satan has her focus on the one thing she can't have. Isn't that amazing how, like of all the garden, the tree of life, relationship with God, perfection, focus on the one thing. Focus. It's be careful what you focus on. We live in what is called, they're calling it now, a, the attention economy. Things, the algorithms are to get your attention. Oh, you looked at a sailboat. You're afraid of water, but we're gonna get you to look at it again. Because our goal is to sell you a sailboat. Attention. That, and that's, that's the whole economy. She saw it, that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of it and ate. She also gave to her husband that was with her and didn't say a word, and he ate. And so she starts thinking, then she starts handling. And here's what happens. We start looking, then we start becoming familiar with the forbidden. She didn't eat it yet. She goes, well, I'm touching it, I'm not dying. God never said, don't touch it. She said that. She assumed if we can't eat it, we can't touch it. Nothing has power over the redeemed. I can touch that. Jesus touched things that were wicked and they didn't affect him, he affected them. 
He said, don't eat it. So she's like, this is all good. This is, mm, look, look, babe. This is a beautiful, whatever it was, pomegranate, apple, maybe, an, maybe something we've never seen before. She's like, you try it. And he's like, well, if it you, you didn't drop dead, I guess God won't kill us. I guess we're not gonna die. And their eyes are open. And what happened was they died spiritually, which results in dying naturally, okay, or physically. So the world begins to die. Everything is fractured. We live in a fallen, fractured world. And that's a whole other sermon for another day. And so they look alive, but they're dying. It's like a branch. If I was to go outside and grab a branch and saw off a branch from a tree and bring it in, and all you saw was the branch sticking out from the side, you go, oh, that's, that's a tree. It's, it's alive. Look at it. It's so beautiful. It's, it's severed. The word death actually means to be severed. It is dying. It looks alive right now because it was so close to the source that it just got disconnected. And so this is why people lived a long time in the beginning of the Bible, and then God set the standard and said 120 years. So that's a whole other thing for another day. But long story short is their eyes were open. Verse seven. And they realized they were, I can't say this the way that you Californians say it. They were naked. Yeah. <laughs> you say naked. I don't like that. It's too long. You gotta say it quick. It's a weird word. Naked. Just get it, get, say it and get it. Yeah. You like to draw that out. Naked. Don't say it like that. Naked. Naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So, they, so mighty Adam, the mighty Eve, sewing fig leaves together and they're making, making aprons. Why are they doing this? Because they're covering. The first thing we do when we sin is we try to cover it up. We tell a lie, we gotta tell another lie to cover that first lie. Cover, 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 cover. You can't get clean unless you come clean and if we cover everything, then what we're ultimately doing is we're bearing our shame or projecting it. We weren't built for guilt, so what do we do with it? We have to, we have to manage it. We're just gonna manage it. We're gonna manage it. And so we, we, some people bury their guilt and they, have to, they, they wrestle it and they manage it internally or they project it. They're just big jerks. And so out of their pain, they're projecting onto other people in scenarios. So Verse eight, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God that was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Imagine this, they're wearing leaves, hiding in the trees and bushes. This is the first camouflage in the history of mankind. <laughs> and what sin does, it makes you crazy. Sin makes you stupid. I hope that doesn't offend you. Sin makes you stupid. We're gonna hide from God. <laughs> we got this. Don't say a word. <laughs> Don't breathe. <laughs> you know, like, like, <sighs> yes. And what used to bring delight now brings dread. The presence of God used to be delightful and now there's dread. And that's what sin does. It takes holy things and makes them feel painful. And some of you may even be here today and you're like, there's a pain around coming to church. There's a pain around talking about God. Pay attention to that. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a thing to know and recognize. Let me ask you this. If you had no feeling in your body, how dangerous would it be? It'd be dangerous, right? You're like, the, the stove's on, you put your hand on the stove, you can't feel it. You're like, Martha? <laughs> Something's burning. Oh, it's my hand. Now my hand has burnt off. I can't feel it. There's no pain associated with it. But now the function of the hand is gone because I couldn't feel. Or, ah, the feeling just saved the hand. The feeling is, a, is, is grace. Be afraid when you don't feel anymore. Be afraid when you don't feel conviction anymore. Be afraid when you're not, you don't sense, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have acted that way. Amen? Let's, let's pay attention to the feel. So they're feeling what they're supposed to feel after they've sinned, but they're doing what they shouldn't be doing, running from the presence of God. And here's what I love, verse nine. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? This verse is so important. God keeps coming down. It's not like God's like, where, where are they? I don't know where they are. <laughs> God shows up to the appointment. He's got a date with Adam. This is where they meet in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve, they walk. I, I read, I I'm, did not tell this to the eight 
o'clock service, nor last night's six o'clock service. They weren't ready for the story, but you are. <laughs> Have you read about these restaurants that are getting on like Match.com or whatever they're called, eHarmony, and setting up false dates? Meet me at this restaurant at five o'clock. And so the girl shows up and she's ready for a date and nobody ever shows, but she already ordered a soda. So she's like, I guess I'll get a salad with quinoa. And I, isn't it terrible? So there's like this whole deal. So anyways, that has nothing to do with anything other than <laughs> he showed up. God's like, hey, nobody's here. But he says, the Lord called to the man. Where are you? Verse nine is the story of the missing man. And this is what we have today in our world, the missing man, the missing father. There's a stat, and, and thank God it's not this way in our church, and I don't even know why it's not this way, but I'm grateful that it's not. But in North America, 70% of people who attend church on Sunday are women. Yeah. The, the, West, the Western North American church is predominantly women. Isn't that crazy? It's not supposed to be that way. The dudes at the house, like, I don't wanna go. <laughs> you go. And so what we do is we, we've, out, so we, we've just got this, we've outsourced teaching, learning, raising kids, parenting. We've outsourced our marriage to a third. We've outsourced, we outsource everything. And so, oh, so, it's Sunday school. Somebody else will teach, teach my kids at school during the week. Sunday school on the weekend, we're outsourcing everything. And I just feel like it's time for men to show up. Just, can I say that? I love some good estrogen in the room. We need it. But we also need some test. We need some men who, like, we see the, we all see the world in a different way, and that's okay. And it's okay for, like, the woman's like, ah, oh, Jesus. And the dude's like, Jesus. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay to be a dude. It's okay to be a dude. It's okay to be a dude. These psychological barriers. Anyways, verse 10, he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. <laughs> so I hid. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman. That you put here, gave me some fruit and I did eat. The Lord said to the woman, what have you done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now I want you to watch this. The first thing they did was they covered up. The second thing they did was hide. Now the third thing they do, they're on the carpet, Blame. These are the three things that we do when we do wrong and then we do wrong about doing wrong. It's either one of these three things or all three of these things. We cover it up, we hide, or we blame. Okay, that's our human nature. We're trying to manage the guilt and the shame. We weren't built for guilt. So, now we're in the blame game. Eve blames the devil, easy, who does Adam blame? He blames two. The woman you gave me. They've covered their bases. It's the devil's fault, it's human's fault, it's God's fault. One of those person's fault, right? Everyone's, everyone's at blame except them. So. God is going to fix things. So the Lord said to the servant, before he deals with Adam and Eve, here's what he does. The Lord said to the servant, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock, wild animals, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. That old Carmen song, Satan, bite the dust. Anybody know that reference? Four people, five people, okay. Okay. Um, I won't go into that verse, but that verse has so much implication on so many levels, but just trust me on that, okay? We'll underscore, we'll mark it, but we'll come back maybe another day. Genesis 3.15. This verse is the proto-evangelion. This is the first good news in the Bible. 
Not that things weren't good before, but this good news is good when there's bad. God is about to introduce to us the thesis for the entire Bible. The entire Bible's thesis is Genesis 3.15. Here it is. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is how I'm going to resolve, devil, what you just did. Every time a woman gives birth, devil, your knee is gonna be shaking because one day he will show up. One day. One day. One day. So, let me explain what this means. Two things. The first thing is this, is that this is what we call a redundancy. So, on a rocket ship, on an airplane, there's redundancies. Program fails, there's a backup program that is, this shuts off, backup program uploads. Many uh, planes will have three redundancies. Rocket ships, uh, spaceships will have many more than that. Redundancy. If this thing fails, redundancy. Here's what is happening in Genesis 3 and 15. The program is shutting down. All the kingdom and all this goodness and all this blessing has been shut down by Adam and Eve. And so God says, reboot. We're uploading a new program. It's gonna take us from Genesis to Revelation to fully upload the program. By the book of Revelation, Satan will be hurled to the earth and then to the pit and then judged and conquered in the sky and then righteousness will reign again. The last two chapters, the garden turns to a city, Jerusalem, and the tree of life will be there again. The entire Bible is this redundancy of this program of the kingdom of God. So you and I are hosting the new kingdom that is moving in the kingdom of salvation and power through the Messiah. Now, what is the Old Testament? The Old Testament is narrative. It is story. It is a story about a family. Everyone's like, the whole Bible is like all these genealogies. You ever, you ever gone through a Bible before, like you've read, and you're like, my God, it's February, and I am reading the list of people's names I can barely pronounce. The guy with four languages can pronounce it, but I cannot pronounce it. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. It's impossible. Why is this all here? Why, why is this all here? Because what we're getting is a story of how God, Cain and Abel, that's a debacle. But a Seth is raised up. And then an Enoch. And then a Noah. And then we have an Abraham. And this seed, they can't see it, but the seed is traveling through the lineage and through time. And from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his lineage to Judah. And all of a sudden, from Judah, this tribe that's growing. And all the Jews are going to be killed by the Persian decree. And God raises up an Esther. And God is saving and preserving seed. Why? Because the seed will be born a Savior in Bethlehem. And so the Old Testament is the story of God saving a seed. And the New Testament is the story of the seed saving the world. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. That's why the Bible is a story. It's a narrative. Robert Alter, I just read his book, The Bible is Narrative. And it just reminded me again that these are stories of real people in their real struggle. When you think about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Abraham, this progenerate Yes, the firstborn, Ishmael should be. God goes, no, this seed's gonna come through faith, not the works of man. It's gonna be Isaac. And then Isaac has Esau and Jacob, and God says, there's a wrestling, a nation is wrestling. And it's not gonna be the firstborn, it's gonna be the second. It's gonna be the second one who, who, who breaks through that matrix, and it's gonna, I'm gonna use, because I wanna show you that the way that I do it is different than the way that the world is. It's an ironclad law that the, the protogenerate, the one who is the firstborn would, would care, but no, no, not my way. And I'm gonna show you that Judah, 
Judah with Tamara, I'm gonna, she, who played the harlot, but she had the seal and she had the staff. And because she had those, she saved her life and her babies. And all these crazy stories that are woven through the Old Testament that lead us all the way to Bethlehem. He will crush Satan's head and his heel will be bruised. He will be a suffering savior when he goes to the cross and they're ripping his body apart. What's really happening is the Messiah is ripping apart the kingdom of darkness. Break this body, tear down this body, and in three days, I'll raise it back up in power and in glory and in salvation. Amen? Now, let me, let me, let me close with this. Genesis 3 and 21 Adam and Eve are being expelled. There's a lot to this. There's two cherubims that won't allow them to come back into the garden to access the tree of life, lest they live forever because God's gift to us is death. You're like, what? Yeah, could you imagine eating the tree of life and then being broken, shameful, forever? God's gift was the reboot, a new Jerusalem a new body, a new heaven, a new earth. He's gonna make it all new and the new creation is living inside of you and the new, the new, the new you is being formed through power of Christ. Anyways, I digress, let me keep going. Genesis 3 and 21 says this, as they're being expelled, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. What were they wearing? Leaves. Why God do you want me to wear Coat of skin, that's weird. I mean, this is Gucci. Fall edition. Pretty good, huh? Fall edition? Come on, somebody. Come on. Fall. This is good stuff right here. Why, why, why do I need to change clothes? What is God trying to give us a picture of? Let me ask this question. What tree can you go to to get a coat of skin? And don't say a fir tree. Don't say a fir tree. What tree? No. A coat of skin comes from something that was living, that had to die. Something innocent died at the hands of God to cover Adam and Eve's sin. What God's saying is, I got you covered. I'll cover you. Watch this, Galatians 3 and 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all the children of God through faith. We're all his seed now. We're his family. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. I mentioned this in one or two of the services last week. I can't remember which one, but it was the idea of like to go to Mars or go to the, go to the moon. You, you can't go as you are. You have to put on something, right? You can't go as you are. To stand in the presence of God and he, he'll see his glory is so, but how do we stand? The Bible says we've been clothed with righteousness. So when God sees us, he sees Jesus, perfect, holy, innocent, so now, Jesus is your passport to move freely throughout the kingdom. What have you done? It's covered forever. What did you say on that post in 2020? <laughs> covered <laughs> by Jesus. I thought about doing a fig leaf covering, like get some fig leaves, and I thought, man, if that thing broke, we'd be all be in trouble. That'd be... <laughs> terrible. Um, so I didn't do that. Um, but those who are in Christ, in faith, baptized into Christ, put into his body. We've not just been put into his body, but his body has been put on us. So when the accuser of the brother goes, he did this, he did this, he did this, the father looks and goes, I see no evidence for that. Do you have any evidence? Well, uh, it's on Facebook. God's like, I don't go to Facebook. (laughs) 
Can I tell you this? God is good. And he's scheming to bless us.